Welcome to episode 20 of the Shoreline Conversations podcast. We are back with our tactic series, back with Dennis. Uh, this will be the last installment in this series for now, for now. Um, and we're just going to go over the remaining couple uh, uh, tactics, as we're calling them, as Greg Kukul calls them in his book by the same name. And uh, so, Dennis, give us a brief overview. We took one week off uh, uh, in between this uh, for the Gary Thomas podcast. So refresh everybody's memory. Where are we at with just kind of the general um, the general kind of rules of thumb of, of our tactics that we're that we're learning here? Well, the overview basically is when using tactics, first of all, you're, you're going to ask questions, period. It's all about questions. And the idea of the questions is not necessarily to seal the deal with the non-believer and get them to accept Jesus right in front of you. The idea is to engage them in conversation that's authentic, uh, that's um, interesting to both parties, and that ends up putting sort of a rock in their shoe. Um, as they go away from the conversation, your hope is that they have a little something that makes them think different, like a rock in your shoe is when you're walking along. It isn't that you you can't walk anymore. It's that with every step you go, oh, that thing, oh, that thing, oh, that little thing. And so that's kind of what we want to do. And that's in line with Coco's feeling that the majority of us, and me included, Aren't aren't the harvesters? I'm I'm not an evangelist who makes an altar call and wherever I go and people drop to their knees and accept Jesus. I think it's beautiful when that happens, and I have friends that are so gifted at that. But I'm like most people. I'm a gardener, and I'm happy to get my my uh, feet wet, my hands dirty, tilling the soil, um, metaphorically speaking asking questions and listening intently and honoring people by trying to draw them out and share how they think the way they do and how they came to the opinions that they hold so that we can dig a little deeper and maybe, just maybe along the way, we can help them see errors in thinking, uh, positions they hold that have no real merit to them, but in a gentle, kind way, a humble way, that again leads them to put a rock in their shoe and perhaps leads them to be more open over time to the Holy Spirit touching them and drawing them to Christ. So that's that's the overlay. Beautiful. All right. So we are we we've talked about a lot about specifics. Uh, um, if you're just tuning into the podcast, I recommend you go back and listen to our other tactics. But our next tactic, that being said, trying to put a rock in people's shoe, uh, having those conversations that are authentic and interesting for both parties. Our next tactic is called sticks and stones, uh, which kind of revolves around maybe when that goal goes awry. Um, what uh, what's uh, what's sticks and stones? What's that mean? Uh, glad you asked, <laughs> because sticks and stones. The only reason Coco uses it is it's a uh, it's a folklorism, so to speak, that uh, kids are raised with over and over and over again. I was I was born in fifty two and I was raised with it. And when you come home and you're hurt and you're sad and parents ask why, you say that Donnie called me, you know, a, a warthog or something. I don't know. And I'm kind of wounded. And the parents say, well, you just tell them sticks and stones or may hurt your butt or may hit your bones or something. And words will never hurt you. Yeah. But the reality is when you're a kid, they do hurt you. And either from parents or peers, they do hurt. But Coco grabs the phrase so that we can have some sort of anchor to understand that when we're called a name as a mature adult, we have more defenses against letting it go straight in to hurt us. We can actually bring out some questions that prevent that from going in, from us taking it personal, from letting it harm us, and sort of hand the ball back to the person using the name or the label. So when someone in the course of a, dis, um, a conversation or an argument, even if it's gotten to that point or a debate, they say, well, you're just a hater or you're just homophobic or you just hate this group or that group and uh, anything like that. Rather than say, hey, 
don't tell me that or don't call me that. What about you, which is sort of a deep-seated human response, lex talionis, you know, the law of the talent, fire back at them with what they did to you. We, we pause for a moment and ask questions. Again, for example, if someone said to me, um, you're an independent, so you must be really one of those Republican types and you, you just hate freedom. You're a hater. And I'd say, well, huh, let me, can I ask you something? Sure. When you say hater, what do you mean? Tell me more about what you mean when you say hater. Uh, and I want to know what they mean. And if they won't answer the question, well, we, we don't have anywhere to go anyway. I would finish with a statement of, well, I, I don't believe that's true. Right. That's what I would say. But so, but what if they did say, well, here's what a hater means. And they gave me more detail. Like, um, well, independent isn't a committed liberal. So that must mean you don't want diversity. You don't want health care for all. You don't want this. You don't want that. You must be against this or that. I would say, well, you know, you haven't asked me about any of those issues. And I haven't shared with you any of my positions on those issues. So, so let's talk more about what do you mean by hater and if how it came to be that you presume I have a position on those issues. So again, as I personally say, Kokel doesn't, but I say, you slow the whole train down. You don't let somebody get away with just flinging mud at you and, and putting their hands on their hips and saying, so there, and right. putting you into defensive posture. We're not going into a defensive posture. We're not going to do that. We're going to ask questions. We're going to not accept the label. And that's fundamental even in, even in uh, human relationships. Because someone calls you something doesn't mean you have to receive it. You, you have other things you can do rather than be hurt and then counterattack. And I, I think Kokel is, is seizing on that. Remember, our, our point is to be thoughtful non-emotional and just go into question mode so that's what we do with sticks and stones right is there um is there uh, there's value it seems like I, I i guess i'll say this more as a statement but it seems like there's value in it's not just getting deeper in the conversation but it's also diffusing uh what is often the beginning of of the rise you know of uh, of temperature in the room uh, once right. the first name is thrown out, that usually is a uh, it, it, you're in very dangerous territory. Is this asking questions? Um, I mean, th this is a sort of obvious question, but um, asking questions about why they called you that rather than responding with uh, the same um, is there value not just in uh, furthering the conversation, but also lowering the temperature in the room. Yeah, I think there is, um, because people call names for a number of reasons, but two primary reasons are, one is that they're used to it. That's what they do when people don't agree. The other is they're upset. They're angry uh, for, for some perceived offense or some offensive position they've attached you to. So lowering the temperature is a good idea. And even identifying what this name calling is about can be very useful. For example, if if I tell somebody I follow the shoreline doctrine on marriage, and someone said to me, oh, you're homophobic, I would say, well, tell me what you mean if you say that. And maybe they would tell me what they mean. And I would say, I, I don't, I'm not homophobic at all. If what you mean is I hate homosexuals, I do not. Absolutely do not. And then I might go to saying, what is it that had you call me a personal name like that? That's a personal attack. What's that about? You know, why did it go straight to that? Whether it's that or you're judgmental or you hate, you know, people who don't look like you or whatever it is, I'd say that's a personal attack. Can we talk about this? Where does that come from? You know, why are you using that right out of the gate? What's going on here? Because you want to identify behavior also. If the behavior is that, uh, you know, strong and um, sort of a caustic or attacking, 
I want to identify that. I want to stop the whole thing. And again, try to lead them into a little more self-examination. Got it. Is there yeah. a difference between uh, somebody calling you a name uh, versus uh, calling you a label? Um, and is there any, are they the same? Are they different, but both unhelpful? Is one actually, so if somebody calls you something and you respond, uh, uh, why, why do you say that? And they respond uh, like, well, this is how I define that. And you're like, oh, well, yeah, that, that does describe me. But there's still this pejorative nature to it. How do you uh, how do you handle that kind of situation? And is there is there a difference between those things? Well, I think there is, Thomas. Um, but right out of the gate, I want to address something you just said in your uh, uh, briefly a moment ago, and that is, if somebody, for example, said to me, "You're an idiot," that's a straight out name calling. I'm then going to set a boundary. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say, "Hey, you know what? That's offensive." And if you talk in those terms with me, I won't be in the conversation. Now, I might want to go Cocal's straight, neutral way and say, so what do you mean by idiot? <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> Personally, I probably wouldn't do that. I'd say, hey, I don't, I don't do this kind of thing. I just don't. If you ask what they mean by idiot, you also might be kind of reinforcing their, their position. But. Right. <laughs> so, so, or idiot or brain dead, you know, dirt brain fool or whatever it is, whatever, <laughs> whatever they're you know, name calling is, I, I don't do name calling right out of the gate with anybody. So I, my own, that's me. Our viewers might have a different way of handling it, but I don't. I'll say, I don't do names. I'm sorry. If that's going to continue, I won't be in the conversation. Now, if somebody has sort of a sweeping label, like, well, because of your position doctrinally, that means you're intolerant. You don't care about others. You're all about this or that then I would still say, all right, look, can I break that down? You've said a number of things, or I'd like to figure out what you mean in each one of the things that you've said. Mm -hmm. You say I'm intolerant. Could you tell me what you mean by intolerant? I might do that. See, I'd separate out the labels. If they say you're judgmental, I would, I would say, tell me what you mean by judgmental. And if they say, well, because, you know, you, you think the way you do, I might follow Kokel's guidance. I might say, so are you saying if I hold this position, I'm intolerant? Yeah. Would you say you're saying I'm wrong? Yes. But isn't your position intolerant by not accepting mine to be in the room with you? Aren't you being intolerant? Sometimes you can expose hypocrisy in the position mm. through sticks and stones. You ask questions till you get to the hypocrisy of it. And I, I think underneath that is that all of us probably have done or will do a similar thing at times. We toss out an opinion. We might use a name or a label, and we really haven't thought it through. It's just, a, just something we say in the moment. But in these kinds of conversations, if that's what's happening in something of importance, we're not going to settle for that. That's why we'd stop with sticks and stones and kind of employ these tactics. Right. And this is all assuming that uh, they're wrong, right? I mean, there are, there are not that this, uh, the method of name calling is ever a way to enact change in a person, but um, uh, it also, is there importance in checking yourself to make sure, maybe even after the conversation's over, after you've separated and, and reflecting like, Am I being overly um, uh, intolerant uh, against this people group? Am I, am I, I say I don't hate them, but are my actions reflecting that? Am I being, uh, am I, is there any truth to this, to this label? And again, not reinforcing that what they did was good or that you should do that to others to get them to, you know, introspect about such things. But is there valuable in uh, maybe taking a step back and not assuming that we're always these righteous people on our high horses and anything they accuse us of is uh, patently false. You know, I, that's a good point. Um, as a believer and someone who is learning uh, more and more on how to do this well, um, we have to shine an extra intense light inside ourselves regularly, not once a year on shine the light within day, but I mean regularly. 
and take that humble introspection and be willing to pray about it, to do your homework and shift positions if a shift seems like the right way to go. Yeah, I think that's a fair statement. I would hope that when I counter somebody who's given me a label or has called me a name, that I'm on firm ground. But again, I don't want to establish my firm ground right now today and hold to the exact same things I'm saying every day for the next 10 years. I want to be in constant prayer, reflection, Bible reading, Bible study, and ask the Lord to convict me. If I need to change the way I see a thing, I need to allow him to convict me. So it really is, there's no arrogance possible in these tactics and have it be effective in the way it's designed. Pride and arrogance must be confronted at every turn, and introspection is critical. Beautiful, beautiful. So is there anything else in this sticks and stones tactic? Um, is uh, I mean, I guess the, the, the goal would be to either expose the... Uh, expose the you know the the unusefulness of their name calling or the hypocrisy like you said but also to kind of get the conversation back on track right right it's to get it back on track and that can go back to the two original questions in tactics if it's back on track then you can go to what do you mean by that mm -hmm. and how did you come to that position that view or that conclusion now you're getting to some meaningful uh, exchange Got it. And hopefully you can get past the name, past the label, and get to the meaningful exchange, uh, going back to over and over again, the original two questions in tactics. Beautiful. So assume we are successful and uh, we've kind of broken down the names or labels and, and we've moved past that on to back to the meaningful conversation. Our last tactic, uh, Kukul calls just the facts, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> it's got some some interesting titles. Explain to us uh, what this one is. Well, I got to tell you, that gave me a touch of nostalgia. I'm like an old dude, and I watched Dragnet live. <laughs> All right. I have no idea what you're talking about right now. <laughs> it's an old police television show with Joe Friday and his sidekick, Harry or whatever, who went on to star as the uh, Colonel in MASH. And they had various uh, criminal behavior they had to address in each episode. And at least once each episode, when Joe Friday is interviewing somebody, he stops him and says, just the facts, ma'am. If they're embellishing or, you know, weaving all over or, you know, getting overly emotional, he just say, just the facts, ma'am. Thereby affirming that police work is done through facts and evidence. Of course, of course. Well, that's yeah. the point of the whole show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Kokel's got to be at least as old as me or in the ballpark, because otherwise, why would he pick this phrase from a show you've never heard about, Mr. Ryan? <laughs> yeah, I, hey, <laughs> I'll have to YouTube it later, you know. I'm sure hey, it's man. all I'm sure You'll it's be hooked. There. I'm telling you, you'll be hooked. There you go. <laughs> Joe Friday. I, I'll tell you what, that's a that's a... A plus name, Joe Isn't Friday. It? That is beyond cool. There's not enough O's and cool for that name. <laughs> so true. So what do we? What is uh, uh, besides the uh, the callback? I I know isn't uh, uh, the Columbo tactic is based on an old show too. This guy likes old cop shows. I think yeah. we can say that for sure. <laughs> uh, we we this whole tactics thing may be loosely based on on uh, old uh, '60s and '70s uh, cop shows. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But but if you dig a little deeper, what's he trying to say with uh, with just the facts, ma'am? I think we can probably get a little hint yeah. at your description of uh, of a, a detective interviewing somebody and just trying to strip away all the all the uh, uh, superfluous stuff and and get just to the facts. Is that an accurate yeah. kind of description? Yeah, I think there? it is. And um, many times in conversations, especially with non-believers or skeptics. Uh, as such, statements will be made by them about or, or information or an opinion given. And I'm listening or whoever's having a conversation listens and saying, what? Where did you get that? You know, one of the classics is uh, related to the Crusades. 
you know, the Crusades and the Crusades, they killed millions of people. That's what Christianity does. Throughout history, Christianity has killed millions of people. That's religious wars, just religious wars. Well, if you've done your homework, and by the way, to use just the facts, ma'am, well, you need to have the facts. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can't do this very well if you don't have information. So it's really important to get information. One of the reasons we're going to offer the best answers to the top 10 questions skeptics ask about Christianity here at Shoreline in a small group curriculum that uh, is in development right now here, because we want people to have the facts. So for example, um, scholars would say in the last 5,000 years, there's been over 1,970 uh, something wars acknowledged wars, big time wars. And out of all those wars, 7% or less were deemed to be religious in any way. Uh, or yeah, 7% or less. So what does that say? First of all, the idea that uh, Christians just kill people and it's the number one reason, you know, people die in wars is absolutely ridiculous. And if you look at outright atheists uh, from the last century, uh, Lenin, Stalin, uh, Mao Zedong, all of them who are avowed atheists and crush religion in their country, they killed right around 100 million people. Well, there's nothing in Christian history that even approaches that. So the idea as one of the reasons I don't follow Christianity is because the church, Christian church has just wiped people out through history. It's, it's the number one cause of death and that's just ridiculous. So I would have that information and, and look for a way to present that. Um, there's all kinds of other situations I can think of. For example, one comes up with the argument against capital punishment. And I'm not, I'm not staking my, my flag here in a position, but I'm saying the argument can go like this. Well, the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not kill. So killing is wrong by your own Bible. Well, that's misinformed. Uh, we know both in the Hebrew and the Greek, uh, thou shalt not kill. The direct interpretation makes a distinction between killing and murder. Murder defined is killing without justification. So killing with justification is not what's intended in the commandment. So if people rest on that and say that's the case against capital punishment, I would say that can be your case, but it's not a biblical case. Because you've got to dig a little bit, figure out what the Greek and the Hebrew mean when translated to really uh, make that claim. Mm -hmm. And there's so many other situations where people present an opinion as fact or as solid data or information. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just not accurate. But if you don't have the facts, you won't know it's not accurate. Right. And. And if you try to engage in that conversation, it becomes a debate, and you can actually do the kingdom a disservice by losing ground in the debate, by not being prepared. There's a there's a lot of different questions that come up with that, and I think that's I think this is a really important one. A lot of this, uh, a lot of the tactics book from Kokul and our conversations, a lot of it. I mean, the books is itself. It's tactics. It's how to navigate these conversations, and I think it's really useful. Uh, really driving the idea of of asking questions as kind of a, as the big tactic and just the different nuances of that, but having the actual facts I think is is huge, and especially today, um, I think on both sides of the aisle, even uh, whether you're having a conversation with a fellow Christian who has different views on things or or a non Christian. Um, uh, there's a lot of facts, and if you're just listening here, I'm doing air quotes here. Facts, right? That they found on uh, on uh, Facebook or or Reddit or or something. And uh, how do we how do we um, uh, tread this ground carefully? How do we be careful that we're not just absorbing uh, 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 information, but we're actually trying to develop an understanding of the facts, not just oh, there's the facts. Let me memorize that sentence. Let me memorize that statistic that I just read somewhere. And then, boom, I can use that in a conversation. But there's no understanding there. How do we 
how do we uh, how do we get the facts in a in a wise uh, way where we actually have an understanding of them? Well, that that's really a, a profound question, Thomas, and I can tell you how I work at that. Um, I agree with you that there's disinformation among Christians and Christian scholarship, uh, or or I would say not disinformation, but uh, controversial views right. within Christianity. So how does one determine where they stand? Um, how does one take a position in a debate? Uh, it's easier to do with a non-believer because they don't believe any of it. It's harder to do with a believer. So how do you figure out what your position is? Number one, this may seem uh, overdone to some, but it's not for me. First of all, I pray. And I ask God, I said, Lord, I want clarity. I, I, I want your Holy Spirit to guide and direct me because I'm at the I'm at the mercy of mankind's attempts at scholarship and man's, you know, various reasons and motivations for living the way they do and and studying the way we do and promoting institutions the way we do. So I need freedom from that. I, I need your guidance. And I'm willing to change my view if you show me. So that's the start. Next. I think every believer um, ought to build up what they believe after, you know, careful examination, their go-tos in terms of base of information and data. Uh, I do. I have certain people that are, I think, time-tested, that I've prayed about, and it makes real good sense to me. It's well-done scholarship. Uh, they're adept at uh, reading Greek and Hebrew. And, and those, those are the places I want to go. I also, when I look at history, like historical accounts, what I want to avoid is hysterical accounts of historical accounts. I just made that up. Isn't that kind of cool? I, I think we need to patent that uh, immediately. I think there's a t-shirt in that. Yep. Copyright, yeah. But the idea is, uh, for example, Dan Brown, The Da Vinci Code. I remember when it came out, and it, it presented itself as historical in, in, in uh, fact, and that what it was doing through the story uh, was exposing falsehoods. Well, for the average person, the scholarly explanation of the stance of the Da Vinci Code theme was, was overwhelming. It's like, wow, these people really have exposed the truth. They're, they're really countering everything I thought was true. So now where do I go? Well, then I want to dig deeper. I want to, again, go find those, pray and find those reliable sources. And, and another thing we do is suspend conclusion until we feel like we've really charted a course uh, based on the evidence that's available. And suspending conclusions is very important to me. Mm. And oftentimes I talk to people say, so what do you think? Huh? Right now, what do you think? I'll say, I'm not ready to tell you what I think. Why not? Are you afraid? I'm not afraid. I'm not ready. I need to read more. Mm. I got to learn more. You just threw that out there. And I might even say, so I, I presume you've done that. You've spent a great deal of time reading and studying and objectively investigating. That's what Nabil Qureshi would say. Are you objectively investigating? And I learned that from him. And so that's how I want to look at it. So if someone makes a claim about what Christians have done throughout history. I have plenty of objective evidence available and data available to let that person know wh whatever your this claim is for you, it's absolutely inaccurate. Or, or if somebody, somebody like, um, oh, even in the Da Vinci Code, that makes a statement that uh, the Nicene Creed, Council of Nicaea, was really a political move to kind of create a myth, and it barely passed the vote of the 320 bishops present. Well, if you if you just read that, you might go, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. That's amazing. I would say, wait a minute. Dig in a little bit. And what you will find is the vote was 318 to 2. And it was not a very close vote. So these little things can make the difference. So if someone's going to be an apologist, there's a great deal of diligence required. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and at times I may change a position. 
I, I, I was just reading something by Dallas Willard yesterday. He wrote 1973 on a particular doctrine. And it's exactly different from something I've believed for 30 years. And I dug into what he said, and I thought, oh, my gosh, I have to shift my position because I looked into what he said, and I see it now. I didn't go deep enough. Right. And that's through. I'm not willing to do that. And through reading, I mean, Dallas Willard is a great example, uh, a fantastic Christian mind, you know, doing the hard work of of reading books, not just posts on, on the Internet. And I'm not saying the Internet's not a great tool. There, there's a lot of amazing information out there, uh, but it's it's just easier to get um, little tidbits, you know, rather than the depth that's required for these topics. Um I love a lot of what you said there. Um, uh, I mean, I loved all what you said there, but uh, um, I just wanted to make sure people know when you say objective investigating, um, just just in case, I, we may have covered this on the podcast before, but explain to us objectivity versus subjectivity. Those may not be familiar terms uh, uh, to people. And I think it's probably useful, especially in this tactic, when we, when we talk about objective facts versus subjective facts. Uh, you know, uh, viewpoints or opinions? What's right. o- objective versus subjective? You know, f- for me, Thomas, a good example is Lee Strobel's uh, book, Case for Christ. He wasn't even really objective, at fully objective at the start. He had an a priori position, meaning a pre-established position. His quest was to disprove Christianity. However, he had enough objectivity from being an attorney from having the habit of weighing evidence, from having enough courtroom experience to know that no matter what your opinion is, the evidence may overrule you or outweigh your opinion. So he took his a priori position, but retained some objectivity and went on a search, meeting with great scholars with specific points, going in there and challenging them to prove it. Mm -hmm. But ultimately he looked at the evidence they presented and it would, and it changed him. It changed his position in every case. So that's what I mean by it. Otherwise, what we have is confirmation bias, and we hold a position that we arrived at somehow, some way. And when we encounter somebody who doesn't agree with us, and perhaps it's someone well versed in tactics, and they're asking questions, we're being forced to look at evidence and talk about how we arrived at our position. And confirmation bias would suggest that even if we're being pulled away from our position by evidence and facts, we we refuse to give up our opinion. Mm-hmm. We hold on to it no matter what. So objective investigation would say that I'm I'm not going to let my confirmation bias dismiss the weight of the evidence. Got it. And that takes focus. That takes attention. So- Self-examination. Got it. So objectivity being um, something where you approach a situation not with your own ideas in mind, subjectivity being uh, something subject, us being the subject, um, it's it's the point of view, it's a biased point of view, which is okay sometimes, you know, if we have biases, you know, I may subjectively love Marvel movies more than DC movies or something like that, and that's totally fine. But in these situations, in these conversations, we're trying to look for that objectivity, not, uh, you know, we're taking the best we can, removing ourselves as the subjects out of the the conversation and looking at the object, the objectivity um, as it stands on its own, right? Right. And some opinions aren't subject to objective Evidence. For example, I was in a class years ago in college and the professor just blithely interjected that Italian food was the best food ever. I had to raise my hand and say, uh, Professor Dr. Smith, I respectfully disagree. I see you didn't use the, uh, the Colombo tactic. Well, what do you mean by Italian food? No, I didn't because I was outraged. <laughs> <Of> course, <laughs> and deeply personally offended. As you should be, as you should be. But Nothing I against said, Italian I to, food. But. I, <laughs> I have to differ with you. However, it's not an objective uh, situation. It's unprovable. Like, you know, do you like um, the beach? Which do you think's best for people, the beach or a hike in the mountains? 
There's a lot of things that don't lend themselves. So you can have your strong opinion, but you cross the line if you try to prove why your position is correct. Right. There's many things that don't lend themselves to objective investigation and evidence. They're Beautiful. just preferences and they're irrational and they don't have to be rational. But in, in conversations with tactics, there is plenty of evidence available. True. So that's the that is the last of our tactics. Um, where where what do we remind us what we seek to accomplish in these conversations? If we've gotten through a conversation, I mean, unlikely we'll we're, we'll unlikely have conversations where every single one of these tactics come into play, right? I mean, right. We we Probably hope yeah. right, and and, and I mean, uh, ideally they wouldn't. You know, ideally the sticks and stones tactic wouldn't come up. Um, but however it, it forms itself. Um, remind us of the goal of these conversations. Uh, what are we trying to accomplish by uh, sharpening up our tactics here? I know the word tactics can sometimes seem a little manipulative. Uh, manipulative. Uh, remind us why we're doing this. Well, we're doing this because you, you hit the key word conversation. We want a conversation. We don't want a battle. We want a conversation. We don't want a, a, a verbal fist fight. And we want to be able to have something we can do if someone near us or around us is tossing out this blatant truth claim that we know has no basis in, in reality. Um, but we want to engage them. We don't want to push them away. And we don't want to do, like, again, the verbal fist fight. So tactics is designed to give us a way to engage with someone who makes a, a truth claim and, and sort of draw them into a conversation. And so Kokel seized on Colombo, and the image is beautiful. And, and, and if any of the viewers or listeners here haven't watched a Colombo, you, you'll only need to watch one episode to totally get this. In, in, in tactics, you become the bumbling detective Lieutenant Colombo. You, you approach it with humility, self-effacing behavior, self-deprecating you know, behavior, but but cleverly just move in and ask things that draw the person out and expose things to the light in a way that's the safest way possible. Mm. You're not calling anyone out, you're drawing them out. You're using their own position to ask more questions. So anybody anywhere can use the first two Colombo tactics. Uh, all the rest you may use uh, as they come up in individual situations, unique situations. But the first two are, are, are so useful for almost any conversations of this light, of this type. What do you mean by that? And how did, how did you end up thinking that? Or what's your view? Or how did you get to that conclusion? I'm using this stuff all the time now mm -hmm. in all kinds of conversations that aren't even related to Christianity. But when somebody makes a bold truth claim, whether it's my kids, my in-laws, or anyone else, I'll just say, okay, that's interesting. So you're, you're thinking this. Remember, you ask them, what, what do they mean by that? Once they tell you again, you say, okay, so your view is. And the idea is you've now encased it. You put it in a little case on the table in front of you. Their view is now there. Right. Then you ask, so how did you get there? And you put that on the table. And from there, you have a lot of things you can work with, a lot of directions you can go. But the idea is you give anybody who uses at least these first two tactics a way to stay in conversations that maybe in their life before they haven't known how to stay in the conversation or they walked away thinking, I wished I could have said something. I, I really wished I knew how to. Well, we're saying even the first two questions will let you dig in Mm -hmm. and hang in. And if you start practicing it, you'll find the other tactics will come up more for you in the different unique situations, all to put a rock in somebody's shoe to help them eventually think a little differently. Beautiful. It's a harvest it, or as a gardening, it's just gardening, tilling and planting the soil. Beautiful. And so if anybody's interested, the book is Tactics by Greg Kukul. Uh, I think if you're watching, it's, it might be backwards on your screen there, the way the camera's set up. But uh, it, it, very interesting. And 
like you said, even using this outside of even conversations about faith or or whatnot, super useful. Uh, I, there's a lot of g- Kukul's own ideas that I'd probably disagree with. Uh, some reading the book, there's some things that I'm like, okay, uh, I'd probably have a great conversation with Kukul. We'd we'd uh, <laughs> Columbo back and forth each other, but but really embracing. Uh, the uh, what he's saying about how to have these conversations, I think, is really valuable. Even you know, despite what you think about uh, Greg Gregory's in, some of his I- interesting examples. Um, right. And here, one more thing, Thomas. People yeah. be on be on the lookout in the middle of March. We're then going to be offering uh, Wednesday night classes, three tactics, two classes, and those are actually using these tactics in real life situations and practice practicing those beautiful that sounds great well i was actually just going to ask um uh where do we go next but i'll I'll say what do we do until then so say somebody's picked up the tactics books they've read it they've listened to these podcasts um they're hungry for more uh do you have any other resource recommendations any speakers debaters online that you uh like that kind of uh, scratch that itch and just continue, um, you know, maybe a hungry mind. Well, I do. I, I've got uh, lots. So some of the uh, tried and true folks are uh, Ravi Zacharias, RZM Ministries, and his panel of speakers, not just Ravi, because he's gone home to be with the Lord, uh, but left a great body of work. But he has a panel. He has a speaker's panel of over 50 speakers, world-class apologists, who answer these questions. You can look at Mike Lakata or Lakata, Lakata, Lakata. Anyway, you can look at the One Minute Apologist. You can look at Dr. Frank Turek. You can look at John Lennox. You look at William Lane Craig and go on from there. Look at the Gospel Coalition, Dr. Timothy Keller, D.A. Carson, and there's great minds at work, young to weathered veterans, I mean, every age imaginable, who speak maybe in the language of your age, (laughs) you know, um, so that you can relate to it. But you go online, go on YouTube, they're all there. Mm -hmm. I would encourage everybody to do that. It's never been easier to to hear great speaking uh, teach, teach you right where you are. So that's my encouragement. Those are some of the names and some of the ways to do it. Beautiful. Yeah, I definitely second William Lane Craig, John Lennox, some of my favorites. Uh, God's Undertaker by John Lennox is a great book. Uh, Reasonable Faith by William Lane Craig, kind of what got me started on apologetics. Uh, uh, super interesting stuff. That's more talking about uh, the just the facts, ma'am. You know, those are those are uh, yeah, some yeah. great, great resources to, to well, you start. Can go, and people can go back for building their base. Uh, G.K. Chesterton. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, C.S. Lewis, um, you can start digging into um, uh, R.C. Sproul. You can, uh, there's so many that are not with us anymore. Great minds and their work is there for people to explore. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Dennis. This has been really interesting, really helpful. Uh, honestly, I uh, I know sometimes the um, the asking questions can get repetitive, but it's it's really helpful for me. It's been like driven into my skull now. Uh, when I when I come up with these conversations, I uh, if I just read it one time somewhere, oh, I should ask questions. Here's the Columbo tactic. I you know I don't know how effective I would remember that in the moment, but since we've talked about so many different angles that we that we can get hit at and and responding with questions, I actually find myself uh, starting to go into that question mode. And I think I, I, you know, I, I oh, love those too. conversations. So I'm excited to see what well, happens. I want to comment about you and as an interviewer, I, in the words of Robert De Niro in the movie, analyze this, you have a gift, my friend. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. You've done a great job. It's been a blast doing this with you. Indeed. Well, thank you so much. I'm sure this is not the last we'll see of you. I can almost guarantee it. The tactics two is coming up. Like you said, maybe even before that, we will definitely get you back in here and uh, start having more of these uh, uh, conversations because this has been really helpful. So uh, thank you once again, Dennis. Thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. We'll be starting a, a, a new podcast series 
uh, next week. We're still ironing out some of the details, um, but uh, you'll have to tune in to find out what it is. So thank you, everybody, and we'll see you Alrighty. next time. Bye-bye. Whether you're watching on our YouTube channel or listening on your podcast app, make sure to subscribe to hear more of our weekly episodes. Thanks for listening.